<laughs> Thanks, folks. Um, uh, first of all, everyone can hear us all right. They, uh, they gave us microphones this time around. So uh, we, we, from last lecture to this one, we blasted right into uh, uh, the modern era, just like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll give a brief introduction for myself before we begin our conversation. And I'd like to say that I'm, I'm happy to be joined by Ryland today. We got a chance to, uh, to steal these stools from the children's section of the library. And uh, tonight's conver conversation, really, it'll, it'll be a lot more relaxed. Uh, uh, last week's lecture um, was uh, about an hour and some change of uh, me behind a podium. And so today I'm really happy to uh, uh, have Ryland up here and we can share some stories together and I'm hoping that um, from that it'll incite some stories from you folks. Uh, we'll have some time at the end again for some questions uh, um, and uh, we'd be happy to answer them for you. Before I begin, you know, like I said, my, my position uh, at World's End is, is called Engagement Site Manager. What that means is I'm involved with uh, managing the Ranger staff. I uh, uh, put together and, and try to execute some public programs. And when opportunities like this come up, you know, celebrating a great anniversary, like 50 years of preservation at World's End, I get to work with great folks like Michael Achille at the library and, uh, and uh, Linda Harper, who, who helped us out early on and was instrumental in pulling this all together. And uh, it, it's a real uh, uh, blessing to be able to work with them and do fun projects like this that really celebrate a property that, that everyone really adores. Um, I first got to know Ryland very early on in, uh, in my tenure as a ranger. I started as a ranger at World's End in 2015. And uh, my first shift was on uh, a Mother's Day of uh, 2015. If any of you have tried to get to World's End on Mother's Day, on a particularly nice Mother's Day, uh, chances are you only got as far as uh, uh, maybe Boulder Glen Road before you hit a line of traffic and decided I'm gonna spend Mother's Day at uh, uh, Webb Memorial State Park instead or something like that. Uh, it's very busy on Mother's Day and, and afterwards, maybe a couple weeks later, um, uh, I was at the gatehouse, or I came through the property, and Ryland was at the gatehouse. Um, and I got a chance to talk with him, introduce myself. I said, oh, uh, Linda White had mentioned, I really got to gotta sit down and talk with you. Uh, you know, she said that my interests might align a little bit with your interest about the property. And, and you know, I'm, uh, my name's Pete, and I'm, I'm here to, to, to uh, meet you. And uh, we got a chance to share that, that his first day at World's End was also on uh, Mother's Day. And, and you know, from, from the records that we have uh, of um, uh, World's End and, and visitorship, you know, we acquired the property in 67. Um, but very soon thereafter, the, the place did start getting busy with visitors. So I'd imagine his Mother's Day, when he started, wasn't too different from, uh, from my Mother's Day experience. Um, Ryland got a chance to tell me uh, pieces of, of what he knew about the property, but you can only learn so much in, in one front porch sitting. Um, one thing that he did say, though, that really uh, stuck with me, and in some ways kind of made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, uh, he, he shared parts of, of his story of, of the property. And then he finished by saying that, um, you know, Pete, if uh, I have so much knowledge of this property, I, I know so much about this place, and I'm just afraid that if I don't tell my story, if I don't share this knowledge, that it's going to be lost when, when I'm gone. And I started thinking about that, and I, well, I better pay attention to this guy. I, I just met him, but I think I'm going to try to absorb as much as I can from him. And, uh, and that's been the story ever since then. Um, and so tonight will be a little bit of a conversation between myself and Ryland. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear about his story on the property, and he'll share some of his information about the place. Um, but mostly what you'll hear, I hope, is something that uh, most of you in this room can relate to, and that's uh, um, uh, a Hingham's perspective on, on uh, World's End. So a person who's been in this town for a long time, uh, who has a connection to this town, and their feelings about a property that, that's uh, so highly valued by uh, the town of Hingham. Uh, so with that, let me introduce Ryland Rogers. And uh, I'll let him uh, give um, a few words, and then we'll get into some questions and answers. So, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background? Um, you know, perhaps where you grew up, um, what you might have done for work, where you went to school, um, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. So my name is Ryland, and uh, I grew up in New Jersey, um, northern New Jersey, a little town outside of New York City. But it had a big portion of the town was woods. And that was my playground. I was out in those woods all the time. And that was very formative. I was um, getting to know nature. 
without studying it, it just became a natural thing that I did. During those years, when I was maybe 10 years old, one of my classmates had a bigger, older brother who was interested in scouting and projecting everything that he had learned. And he became my mentor. And I took those times of absorbing what he was teaching and that it stuck with me my whole life. And it actually became my formative education in nature. I went through the scouting program. I became an Eagle Scout and moved on from there and graduated from high school in New Jersey and then went off to college, got drafted in the Army in the Korean War. And when I came out of the Army in 1953, I got a phone call and at that time, my parents lived in Worcester. So I was home with them, and I got this phone call, and there was a young lady who was home from college and had some friends with her and wanted to set up some, I guess you'd call them dates. <laughs> <laughs> Still do. And uh, so I was just fresh out of the army, sure, I'd be happy to do that. So at the appointed time, I went to their house and was escorted in, and they were finishing up with dinner. I sized up the room, as guys do, <laughs> and there was this one girl, I thought, boy, there's the one for me. Yeah. And it just happened that I was seated next to her, and so I met my very lovely wife. <laughs> she, she became my wife. Um, Gunny, uh, we've, uh, we spent that night um, dancing, and partying, and then at the end of the night I said, well, I'd like to see you again. And she said, oh, but I live so far away. <laughs> This is Worcester to Hingham. <laughs> okay, so you're in, you're in Worcester uh, no, for this yeah. party, and, and you're finding out now that, yeah. that Gunny is, is so tells from Hingham. So she says yeah. she's from Hingham, and I said, what's a Hingham? <laughs> <laughs> I'd never heard of it. A fair question. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I said, but I will find it, and I will meet you next week. And so I came down, and turns out that she lived on Martin's Lane, about 100 feet from the property of, the, of World's End. So we started going out that summer and we had a great time together and that was my first introduction to World's End, 1953. Hmm. And of course I was courting, so I didn't get a chance to do much wandering in World's End. You had other priorities at the time. I did. Yeah. So, so you find out that uh, that uh, uh, Gunny lives in, in Hingham, and you start uh, visiting Hingham, I suppose, uh, whenever you can. Um, and it just so happens that she lives down the street from World's End, uh, right there in Martin's Lane. But um, could you elaborate a little bit more on perhaps um, Gunny's specific tie to World's End? And, uh, and you know, now that we've introduced her as, as uh, a person in your life, uh, what does her story mean to well, the property? The, her father, both her parents came from Sweden, and her father went to work for the Brewers in 1924 as a laborer, uh, worked the farm, and uh, he and his brother, Algot, um, spent their time. Now, in 1924, there wasn't a lot of mechanization, so they still had a big labor force but as time went on, that got cut down. Eventually it ended up there were three guys doing the work out on World's End. Gunny's father, Gunny's uncle, 
and the third guy was Arthur Edwards. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard that name before because there's a memorial at World's End uh, which mentions him. Right. So before we get too far into uh, uh, the story of, of, uh, of uh, Gunny's father and, and that connection, um, I want to touch a little bit more on you know, uh, this, this idea of you coming to Hingham um, and, and what that started to mean to you. So, so you courted Gunny for, for a number of years. Well, three years. And then Eventually, we, I guess things worked out. We, we, we were married in 1956 when we got out of college. Right. And uh, we went to Rochester, New York for our career. Okay. And uh, we had our tie back in the Hingham with Gunny's folks. And as our family grew, um, we came down to Hingham several times a year. Maybe Christmas, Thanksgiving. Yes, yeah. and always for their two-week vacation in the summer. Okay. So it was a place that, at that time, I wasn't courting any longer, so I had more time on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to uh, start exploring World's End. And as your kids grew up, I'd imagine they got rather adventurous themselves. Well, they were... Very adventurous. All right. And, I and heard they, a couple stories from you about uh, uh, maybe your explorations, not just through the property, but, but around some of the fun places to explore in Hingham. I mean, you're visiting uh, uh, her parents' house right there in Martin's Lane. Uh, you got out to the Harbor Islands. Um, well, we did. Yeah. I, I, that, I was always interested in the water. Um, I always wanted a sailboat. My first sailboat was a sunfish. So when we'd come down for our vacation, I'd bring the sunfish with us. And put it in the water, and then I was a dutiful father. I, I babysat the kids. Right. So we'd go out on, on the sunfish, and I'd take them out to this island, which is Langley Island in Hingham Harbor. And you see this nice gravel beach here. We would pull up there, and I'd drop the kids off and go to it. They would play their games of pirates and all those things, and they thought that was wonderful. Well, what to do for me, I had to go out sailing. So <laughs> that was uh, my excuse. So I circumvented uh, the world's end a lot by water. Right. So, so it, was, it was an adventure for really both of you. You had the excuse to take your kids out there, but then That's you got right. a chance to explore on your own. But yeah. then I'd go back and pick them up, I think. <laughs> um, I'd always, I always pick them up. And we come back, and of course, very often, what happens on the coast is you have a tide that ebbs and flows twice a day. So many, many times we'd come back and there wasn't enough water to get back in. We'd end up pulling the boat in by, through the muck yep. of Martin's Cove. Yep. Um, so we had a lot of experience doing that. So let's let's transition back now to uh, to Gunny's father. You mentioned that uh, he actually worked for uh, uh, the Brewer family, and perhaps it was uh, the Brewers, and then into into the Walker family. Is that true? That is right. Okay. When he when he went to the estate in 1924, um, Fanny Brewer, who was a daughter of John Brewer, the original owner was running the farm. And uh, so he was working for her and she died in 1936. And then her niece, Helen Brewer, was married to William Walker. Hmm. And William Walker became the executor of the estate and took it over and ran it. Not as a profitable farm, but just maintaining the property as it was. Sure. So. During that time, um, after 36, Mr. Walker took it over, and essentially that's who Gunny's father worked for. Right. So you mentioned that you first started uh, coming to Hingham in the 50s. Um, the trustees didn't acquire the property until uh, 1967, so you actually uh, uh, remember the property yes. um, uh, before it became a public reservation. Yes. And perhaps you even remember it to some extent towards uh, what it was like when your, your father-in-law was working there. 
Um, if you could, you know, describe a little bit about maybe uh, uh, what his efforts might have been at that property, um, what they might have still been doing, and then describe the landscape a little bit. I'd imagine at that time things looked a little bit different than little they do different. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, essentially, he and the other two guys were taking care of the whole property, um, doing all the maintenance, and uh, they cut the fields every year at the end of the year. Hmm. And uh, in order to take care of the things they didn't want around, like invasives, they burned the fields. They burned every field every year. Never had a problem doing it. The, uh, but what they, they would spend their time out there doing whatever maintenance chores needed to be done. During this time, um, when I was wandering out there. Now this is not a public park. This is private property. But Mr. Walker was very good about letting people use the property who wanted to. Mm. And so I would wander out there and, and got to know the property pretty well. One instance I remember it was time for lunch, and I went out to find Gunner, Gunny's father, to tell him it was lunchtime. Sure. And he was out at Rocky Neck. Now, if you've been to World's End, you know what Rocky Neck looks like. It, big, big cedar trees and rock outcroppings and pretty wild. Well, in 1950s, those trees weren't there. There was level land, and... So I could go out there and look across the field and spot them and go talk with them. You couldn't do that today. That to me seems remarkable. You know, when you think about it, uh, you head out there, sure, you're just giving them a call for lunch. But what that what that story means today to me is that uh, you saw those trees grow up. That's correct. Uh, you know, now these trees that tower, I don't know, 30, 40 feet, some of them, yeah. um, at least, right? Um, then you could actually see over them. Yes. And, uh, and that, that speaks, that's a testament to uh, the amount of time you've spent on that property and, uh, and, and how it's developed during the time that you've been visiting it. Um, but again, okay, so back to the timeline. This is um, uh, in the 50s. Um, we're getting closer now towards the time when um, uh, the trustees will purchase the property. Right. Um, but of course then, uh, you're still uh, uh, in the middle of your profession uh, and that's in Rochester, New York. Yes. And you are raising your family. Um, and so you're just visiting Hingham a few times a year and you're getting out to World's End. Um, what did it end up by happening, say, uh, post-retirement? Um, how did you end up by, you know, you're up here today talking about the property. So tell me a little bit about post-retirement and what, what eventually got you to uh, this, this spot where you're at right now. Well, after I retired in 1987, and we, we were, at that time, we were taking care of Gunny's folks with us up in Rochester. In the late 80s, they passed away. And all of a sudden, this hanging property is available. And we say, what are we going to do with that? Because we had our lovely home in Rochester. And we sort of looked at each other and said, you know, it's right on the water. <laughs> right next to World's End. That's pretty nice. So we decided to uh, go back to Hingham. So what we did, we really tore the old house down, which was a small cottage, and rebuilt, which is our present home now, and moved down in 1990. So I had time on my hands, and there's World's End right there, and so I started getting serious about wandering and learning and observing and trying to figure some things out, and uh, spent a good deal of my time out there. In the meantime, Gunny went back to teaching, and so she was gone all day. <laughs> and there was an opportunity one time when the, the trustees 
needed a ranger. And I went down and Al Yelenezian was the superintendent. And I, he was down there working and I went to him and I said, hey, um, any chance you'd take me on as a ranger? And he said, in a minute. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so that's how I became a ranger. Rangering, I think, you know, I've, I've looked through the, the history books a little bit within the trustees and the ranger was a little bit different back then. I mean, nowadays, uh, and, and I was a ranger myself for a few years, um, but it's, it's mostly a, uh, you know, a welcoming uh, a, a little visitor area. You have the gatehouse, people come into the property and, uh, you know, if you have a membership, great, you come on in. Um, if, uh, if you didn't have a membership, there's an admission fee and, and that's how it operates. And most rangers spend most of their hours right there at the gatehouse. But, uh, but Ryland, you were telling me that when you got brought on, uh, your position was a little different. Well, it was, it was regimented a little differently than it is now. There was a head ranger who was Joe Lincoln who many of you know, knew. Um, he lived right outside the gate. Incidentally, that little house right there is where my wife first came after she was born. Hmm. Her parents were renting that house. But... The old that, Lincoln house on the corner. The Lincoln house yeah. on the corner. Yeah. But it, now that he was a family man, he had responsibilities, so he went and bought the house at Martin's Lane that we have now. Anyway, um, I became a ranger in 1994, and uh, I worked on the weekends, uh, both Saturday and Sunday. And I did that for three years. And as you mentioned, my first day was Mother's Day. And at that time, we didn't have picnics. That's you right. You could not picnic on World's End. It was a trustee's edict. Right. I didn't agree with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what my would be the first thing you didn't agree with as far as trustees My very first rules assignment yeah. as a ranger was to walk around the property and tell people they couldn't have their picnics. <laughs> 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 and that didn't work with me very well. <laughs> I recall telling people, you know, you're not supposed to be picnicking, but you're all set up here. Enjoy your picnic, but <laughs> we don't allow it. <laughs> so, so anyway, I... I yeah, not to uh, interrupt, but any reason why that was the rule? Was it, I mean, again, 67, we acquired the property. Um, uh, any idea I, what the thought might have been behind that? I cannot imagine that that's so anti trustees it's, sure it doesn't make sense to me sure I, I mean i had i had heard one thing at one point that uh, uh especially at world's end where it had been quasi uh, uh public use even though it was privately owned that and again you know 67 that the anti-picnic rule was simply uh let's let's do whatever we can to keep the hippies out of here um but well, there, 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 yeah, there was yeah. an effort to do that. right that's right true. um uh, at any rate, uh, go, go on. So. <laughs> so my job on those weekends um, as a ranger was because Joe took care of the gatehouse. That's right. Yep. The other crew was up in the parking lot doing parking. Mm -hmm. And I had the good fortune to be assigned to be a roving ranger. Right. So I spent my day walking the property and interacting with people and finding that it was very interesting to stop and talk to people and tell them what I knew about the property or what about my interpretation of the nature of the property and answer questions that they might have and and I loved that. And that, that went on for three years. Right, which is interesting to me. I mean you mentioned that uh, uh, yes you had your your upbringing with with your patch of woods in new jersey and then eventually you got into scouting um you developed this this love for for the study of nature really it was it was an early education um, um but you've also mentioned to me some of your your uh, gallivants out into other properties and how you love getting off the trail and not only do you like getting off the trail mm -hmm. but there's something actually for you about getting away from the crowd getting well, away from people and so you have this kind of uh this 
It's a dichotomy. Isn't it, it certainly is, where you became the roving ranger, and you actually get a chance to share everything you know about the place, and you get yeah. to talk with people. Yeah. But at the same time, at World's End, you're you're learning the place more. You're getting off the trail. You're walking on uh, uh, lesser known trails, and, and kind of a balancing things out. You get your quiet time out there, but you also got a chance to talk with people. Right. Yeah. But it, and and that's important. Because to get to know the property, you got to get off the trail and do exploring and, and groveling around and bushwhacking. You mentioned other properties. Early on, I spent a lot of time over at Wampatuck. Wampatuck is a wonderful piece hmm. of land. And it was farmland, and there are stone walls in Wampatuck. And you can <coughs> grab onto a stone wall and follow it and just figure out what did that farm plot look like? You know, where did this wall go? And the only way to find out those things is by bushwhacking. And so that, I've done that on World's End too. And yeah. what, about, uh, what about some experience even say, uh, yeah. while you had your career out in Rochester? Um, I'm gonna imagine this is a formative time for your kids. You might be well, taking them out more and more. That's um, where we we raised our children in Rochester. We had it was a wonderful environment. Rochester is not that far away from the Adirondacks. Hmm. Well, the Adirondacks is my very favorite place in the world, other than Hingham. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the Adirondacks became my playground. I did a lot of hiking, a lot of canoeing. When my children got old enough, I introduced them to camping and hiking. And so it was a great excuse to get away with the children. I had to teach them. And uh, so all of my children went with me. At, I'd take them individually usually, except that we had twin boys. And I always took them as a pair. Hmm. And so not only were they learning nature through me, but uh, they, they had the good fortune to love what we were doing. You also introduced them to skiing at one point, if I recall. Well, uh, that, that would, I, didn't, I didn't do that. Uh, I introduced <laughs> them to cross-country skiing. Oh, okay, 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 technicality. But they found out about downhill skiing Rochester is not mountainous, as many of you know, but they do have some hills, and they had this one place that was called Bristol Mountain, which was a ski slope. And they offered high school students a package for $100 a year. They could get bussed down to the mountain once a week and ski and then bust back. So all of our children did that, and they, they formed a love for skiing. Right. To the extent that of my four children, three of them live in Montana and Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> so they are still skiing. The fourth one is smarter. He, he's a New Englander. Sure. I mean, for most of the people in this room who do uh, know Rhode Island, or at least had a chance to, to visit him at the gatehouse, uh, every year, and it was actually just about a month ago or so, uh, family comes to town. Um, all the kids come back from uh, various uh, states that they live in, Montana, Idaho, um, and, um, uh, and they get a chance to visit the same property that uh, Rylan and Gunny were visiting um, uh, when when you were out in Rochester, right. and so there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of a pattern there, well, um, the, and it could be yes, it's the family plot, um, but it's also World's End, and it's a place that you guys get to walk. I know I've been out on the property, uh, uh, perhaps later than I should, and I see a group of people coming walking. I'm ready to kick them out because that's that's part of my job, anyways. Um, and sure enough, it's Eric. I see Eric yeah, walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he comes yeah. walking by with the dog and the wife and and, and the children and. Um, Talk a little bit about your, uh, your experience on the property um, uh, after uh, you had moved into your in-laws' uh, uh, property and having your kids come back and visit uh, year after year. It was the place where um, uh, 
uh, again, you explored the harbor with them, you explored World's End when they were children, but now that they're growing up and have their own grandkids, uh, now they're coming back they're, too. They're doing the same thing that, that um, I did with them when they were little. They, they're taking their kids out there, they're enjoying the property, they're um, learning the same kinds of things that my children did at that stage, and uh, so it's a continuum. It, it's around and around. And there's something significant about that, about seeing families come to the property. As a matter of fact, I was telling Ryland right before we got started today, I was upstairs uh, doing a little bit of printing because our, our printer at the office was on the fritz. I had some lecture notes, believe it or not, that I needed to get printed off for tonight. And uh, the woman at the desk, uh, she was great, her name was Terry. Um, and uh, uh, she just, you know, in passing mentioned, oh, World's End's great. I love World's End. As a matter of fact, my family comes to town. Um, it, it's the place I like to take them. I said, you know what, that's a constant refrain in the town of Hingham. Um, uh, for folks who live here, when, when their family from, from out of town or perhaps even out of the country, when they come to visit, World's End is a destination for them. Um, and we got chatting about it while I was just doing some, some uh, menial office work up there. It's a place that, uh, that you can get away from everything else. It's, it's you and your family and this beautiful back, backdrop. Um, and, and it's certainly a place that, that draws families in. So we can touch more on that as we move on, but I, I want to get back to uh, uh, your work on the property. So you become a ranger, you're walking some of these cart paths that we see uh, photographed here, and you get a chance to talk with people. Yeah. Your, your knowledge of the property, of course, is growing as you're um, sharing the, the stories of the history of the place. Um, uh, and you're, you're getting a chance to get off the trail, away from some of the crowds, and, uh, and, and learning the property on your own. If we flash forward a little bit uh, further, um, you actually got a chance to, to put together um, a little bit of your own, uh, we'll call it an inventory, we'll call it a history book. You got a chance to work with uh, another gentleman who um, uh, started off as just a visitor to the property. Right. And then um, along with you became somewhat of a volunteer. And not long after that, he also became an employee. So why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, the project that got kicked off in uh, uh, the 2000s um, that, that really um, uh, uh, caused you to explore the property in, in ways and, and inventory the property in ways you hadn't to such great detail before? Well, I, from the time we came back in 1990, I spent a lot of time in World's End, not only walking and learning the property, but seeing things at places where things were being coming overgrown, the fields were being encroached upon, from the edge of the woods. So I would cut back and do some volunteer work. At one point, when I was in the midst of doing this and exploring and thinking about what went on here several hundred years ago and trying to nebulously formulate some ideas, I ran into a guy who was visiting and we struck up a conversation and mutually hit it off and had some similar interests. And this was Paul Lindell, who is here tonight, Paul. And Paul and I started formulating ideas and why does this stone wall look like this? Or why is this road here? Just starting to think about it. And we started wandering the property and, and investigating. And then I'd go out and I'd see something and I'd come back and I'd tell Paul, you know, I wonder about this little thing. And so he'd go out and he'd look at it on his own and he'd come up with an idea and we'd share our ideas and come to a conclusion. Well, that got, we got more and more deeply into that. And it ended up, we started trying to formulate a history hmm. of the land. So it started off as just a, a curiosity and then you ended up hmm. by uh, uh, acquainting yourself with each other while you're out there, 
Um, and as you dove deeper into it, I'd say that you, you probably came up with some kind of a focus, some kind of a... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we, we, we started, well, one of the specific things we did, we decided we will find all the stone walls on the property. And not all of them were obvious. A lot of them were no longer there, essentially, except little clues that there was a stone wall there. Or they, we knew because two contiguous places, there had to be a wall between them. But we mapped the entire stone wall network at World's End. And Paul, if nothing else, is very meticulous. <laughs> and Paul just so happens to also be our mechanic, so if, if there was ever a machine that was broken, uh, he was also the one to fix it. Uh, a little bit of a uh, technician's mind. So, so Paul ma got a mapper, tried every single foot of the stone walls, came up with a total number of feet of wall in the property. And it turns out that that's just about two and a quarter miles of walls. So that was, that was an emphasis. And this map that is up here shows several things, but for instance, this is a stone wall. This is a stone wall. All these are networks of walls. Um, this is damn meadows here with stone walls around. So all of this turns out to be two and a quarter miles. Um, so that was one phase. A second phase, we realized there are a lot of roads in World's End that are not recognized any longer. They had uses when they were put in, um, but no longer being utilized that way. What we're actually looking at here is one of those roads you mentioned, but we're looking at it from down in the muck. Um, and what we're looking at is, is more or less a retaining wall. Um, why don't you speak a little bit towards this photo, um, what you know about this section, and, and maybe shed light on where it is for the audience on the property. Okay, this, this wall, believe it or not, is one of the faces of the causeway at the end of Martin's Lane. Um, and this was laid up, and we think it was right about 1700. 17, end of the um, 1600s, and they laid this wall up where they put the causeway. This is matched over on the other side of the wall by a very similar wall. You don't see it today because the sand is built up and covered it. But that causeway was made and then filled. That causeway allowed the farmers to come down Martin's Lane and access the property across the causeway. So they could bring their carts out to the fields. And this is a picture of the of the road along the water. We'll cross that causeway and if you keep going, this is the road which is probably the first road that was on World's End. Hmm. Could you go back to the map? Sure, yeah. This, now the causeway was right here. And then this road was brought out this way. Well, predating all of that network, this was how they accessed World's End. Because at the time, this was water ran through here, tidal flow. So they had no land access. So they came by boat from in Hingham Harbor. They landed on the beach and they built a ramp up onto the land and that picture 
this picture is that road. This was all buried and we dug it out or uh, cleared it so that we could see it. Now you can see little pebbles or stones here. They improved the road by, by laying this foundation of stones off of the beach. Hmm. That's how they originally accessed World's End because go back a little farther, 1635 when they landed in Hingham. They built a stockade down in the cove which protected them but they needed to have crops because they didn't have a grocery store to go to so they would they, they came out to World's End, the fertile land out there, farming turned out to be very good. And they could, uh, they, they gave, assigned little plots to each family and they could come out to World's End, access their plot and work the land. So a couple of interesting things there. You mentioned that you kind of rediscovered this road. Yes. Um, and in order to actually really take a closer look at it and actually see the uh, some of the uh, more or less cobblestones that were that were laid in. Um, you ended up by clearing most of it. You, you got right. in there and, and opened up the roadway again. Yes. This was actually happening in other sections of the property as well. You'd find a stone wall and it was buried behind 15, buried. 20 yep. feet of, of overgrowth that had encroached on what used to be an original field edge. That's and correct. so, yes, you're putting together this inventory of, of, uh, of landmarks that are on the property but you're actually starting to be a little bit of a volunteer. Um, you're, you're starting to do things that, that we do as part of uh, normal maintenance on the property now, um, and you're bringing the property back to life. You're looking at it, um, you know, yes, it's this Olmsted landscape with these uh, winding carriage roads, but, but Paul and Ryland were looking at stone walls and this old road network. They're looking at a, a landscape as it would have dated uh, prior to, to Olmsted's construction there. And, um, and you're bringing that back to life, and now, um, it, it, it really is fully not just a, a piece of the, the history of the property again, it didn't get lost out there, um, but it's actually in a lot of ways um, uh, places for people to, to now uh, treat for, for recreation. People walk this path now That's right. um, and, and they're able to um, get off the, the main carriage road and, and take a walk down here. I'll have to say when, um, when he was telling me this stuff for the first time and I'm sitting there at the gatehouse uh, porch. And I, I believed most of it. Um, I, well, I don't, you know, how much do I really know? How much does he know? Um, but I'm sitting there listening, and, and he goes on to tell me about these actually these little cobblestones that are in the ground, and that's where I kind of drew the line. I, I don't know if that's. A, I went out there, and sure enough, they're there. <laughs> and the more and more you listen to Paul and Ryland, and it sounds like they're really um, uh, uh, leading you on. Uh, you get out there, and you start walking around, and uh, something called an M wall actually exists something called a cal stone is really there. Where when they said that there's a, a fence post out on Rocky Neck, uh, you know, um, about 20 yards away from the largest cedar tree with the broken branch, you see the largest cedar tree with the broken branch, you walk 20 yards and there's the fence post. Um, you know, it, it, the place started to come to life for, for someone like me as well. Um, we'll move quickly through this photo, but you, in, you inventoried the walls. We inventoried the walls, this is one of the intact walls. Right. And several things about this. Um, at this end, this opening here is a gate. This is how they access the field. The road came up this way and they could get into the field here. So in these walls we discovered where the gates are. This in the background is a property that Brewer did not have originally. It's called the, the uh, Barnes Lot. And it um, is surrounded by walls on all four sides. And it has gates into it. Um, so they, they had access. Now these walls, now this is a pretty formal wall. It's not just a pile of rocks. These rocks were carefully placed to fit so that it became a contiguous line and they could um, use it as a property line. Hmm. Um, and not only that, but this wall, if you folks know where it is on the property, uh, you walk up Pine Hill, 
you continue on uh, through the property and uh, you get to the, uh, the split where you can go straight to start heading up Planters Hill or you continue around uh, to the left which, which runs the contour and it'll eventually take you down to the bar. This wall runs along uh, the road that leads up to the top of Planters Hill and if you look at that wall carefully, um, um, and again this is a part of studying the, the, the landscape, um, the wall changes stone material at one point. The stones are a little bit of a different size, um, a little bit of a different wall construction, and it's pretty clear. It's, it's an indicator of, uh, of uh, work that was done uh, on the property at a different, uh, at different time. At a different time. And so the more you study the landscape, um, the more you pick up on these intricacies. And, uh, you know, from listening to Paul and listening to, to Ryland, um, you know, the next generation kind of kind of picks up a little bit here and there. Um, I went out and started exploring on my own. Um, I started finding fence posts with old hinges still left in them uh, that speak to a, a, a time when the property was used for, for grazing, when they had to have things fenced in and, and maybe it was cattle or perhaps it was sheep out on uh, World's End proper. Um, I found things like the Calstone out on the beach. Um, and and uh, you know, you have to wonder, you know, everyone wants to think that the L probably stands for Lincoln. Who really knows? Um, but, uh, uh, but in Hingham, why not, right? Um, <laughs> and I found, you know, old uh, cedar trees. They were cut down deep in the woods, used for fence posts. And the more you study the landscape, the more you get, you know, uh, curious about what else might be out there. It's only 251 acres, but actually, if you get off the trails a little bit, there's quite a bit to find. So speaking of that, you know, you put this project together. Um, uh, at this point, you know, we're into the 2000s. Um, you've been on the property for a while now, uh, yes. both as a, as a visitor, you know, before it was a trustee's property. Um, you're out there with your father-in-law. Um, you become a ranger. You introduce people to the property that way. And then you explore the property further with Paul. I'd imagine that you have some spots out there that you'd consider uh, your favorite or favorites, I'm not sure. I mean, is there a favorite spot? A favorite spot? The simple answer is no. <laughs> it's all, it's all favorite. This is one of my favorite spots. This, this is the Oak Hickory Forest, which is very interesting. It's a, roughly a rectangle that goes from Martin's Lane and Croydon Road and Dam Meadows. If you go from Martin's Lane straight back to the Weir River, that defines a rectangle. And it was called the Loud Lot um, because it, a man by the name of Loud owned it. In fact, the deed to my property has the name Loud on it. It was hmm. a Loud Lot. This is a path that goes back through that Oak Hickory Forest going toward the Weir River. Now, an Oak Hickory Forest, unfortunately, is very hard to find these days because of development and things have, have changed. Land has been cleared. This piece of land probably was never lumbered, never clear cut, which back in the 18th century lumbering meant clear cutting. It was used as a woodlot. Hmm. We know that. Um, there, there's been a forest there for many years. In fact, Pete talked about it last week about the split oaks, which came up from a stump of a cut tree. This is an example of that. Hmm. Anyway, um, there's a, there's a great place. Now, we've just switched to Rocky Neck. Up on the, uh, on the outcropping, on the north side, looking back, this is Planters Hill, that's World's End, this is the causeway. Um, you get a view like that, that's an incredible experience. Little fog, you know, Planters Hill is back here. We can't see it because it's lost in the fog. That's a great place. And um, you, you mentioned, uh, and we don't have a great image of it up here, but Planters Hill is captured at the end there. Um, the views from Planters Hill aren't too bad either. 
and you've had experiences to be up there at all different times of the year and seen pretty much everything you can see from the top. Well, there's a favorite place, one of my favorite places, top of Planters Hill on a clear day, you can see Cape Ann, which is some 30, 40 miles away on a clear day, Cape Ann. Now, I don't know, if maybe from the Blue Hills you could see Cape Ann, mm. but I, know, I don't know of any other place on the South Shore where you could get that view. Just a little, that, that looking north, of course, you have the fabulous view of the Boston skyline, if you're into that. <laughs> but just take a little turn around toward the south a little bit, right behind where Joe Lincoln's bench is. There's a great big oak tree um, on the corner of the path that goes to Arthur Edward Memorial. Mm -hmm. You stand right there a little, little bit higher than other places and you look down past the whole town hall and you can see out to the ocean and you can see Minot's light right. from World's End. Hmm. I bet not many people know that, but it, you can do that. Right. So the Oak Hickory Forest, Rocky Neck, Planters Hill, um, and then there's some certain sites at World's End that, that you've had an affinity for uh, for a long time. I have, I have a very special affinity for this it, for several reasons. One, my house looks right out on this. This is what I see in the wintertime, is this line of oaks right across there and then the city of Boston right behind it. Two, they're magnificent oak trees, and they formed a, a line, a property line, I think. They were planted, specifically, right along a fence line. It was a rock wall. The rock wall is no longer there, it was removed. But we know there was a rock wall there from evidence. But the thing that just blows my mind is the genius who planted those trees. Because you, you can see, this is about 200, 250 feet apart. And this canopy matches. So you get a continuum right across the tops of those trees. It just Absolutely incredible. How did the guy that planted them know that that was going to happen in 150 years later? I don't know. Mm. We figured these were planted somewhere around 1800. Unfortunately, we lost one of them. It, um, over a two year period, it died. And uh, speculation was, was it a pathogen that got it? Well, not knowing, we, we removed the wood quickly and got it out of there so the other trees weren't affected. But I do think what had happened, it had a lightning strike, got damaged, and that probably did it in. Hmm. You had a chance when that tree came down to actually take a look at the stump. I did look at the stump. I counted rings and not very satisfied with, with the result. I didn't come up with a finite number, but it, it put it between 1800 and 1820. Hmm. That's before Brewer got involved. So it was another landowner. So some of these photos that we've shown, and most of them are, are Ryland's uh, own photos, times he's gone out on the property and, and taken pictures himself. But uh, they show the property in different seasons. Um, we've seen it now through the summer, and we've seen it 
uh, in some of those last images there, early spring, uh, before the leaves come back out again. Talk about the seasonality at the property. And um, yeah, now is the time of year. I, I can tell you as one of the, the site managers over there, yeah, there's quite a few visitors coming in. So that would say that maybe summer is people's favorite month. Um, but maybe that's not always the case. What, what would not the case be for case. you? Not always the case. And uh, somebody asked me about that and I said, um, I said, what is your favorite season? And I said, oddly enough, it's not summer. Hmm. Although summer is lovely. But fall has a very special aura to it. The, the land is going to sleep. The leaves are changing colors. The colors out there are incredible in the fall, morning, noon, or night. And all shades of, of leaf changing. And the, the very special aura in the sky during that time. Spring is fantastic because it's rebirth, regrowing. You get a million different shades of green from different plants at different times. And it, it's very exciting. Oddly enough, this obviously is in winter. It was late February. We'd had a snow. I was out there. I had a camera with me and just came across this view. This is a side, the east side of Planters Hill looking up along the ridge line. Sun has just set. Everything is blue. This blue hue on the water, on the snow. And it just it struck me. As a matter of fact, I have this picture posted on my computer. But it that may be may be my favorite time of the year. Which now, is interesting because you told me a story about even growing up in New Jersey when that wasn't necessarily the case. I was growing up in New Jersey, sometimes it was cold, sometimes it was not cold, there wasn't much snow. Other times it was good snow, but very often conditions would be very sloppy. And it was cold, it went right to you. And I didn't like that at all. And I hated winter. And I, I was always cold. Well, fast forward to our married life, and we had our first child, who was born in December. And that next winter, when she was one year old, I would take her out, and I'd get all bundled up and be <laughs> miserable, and I'd take her out, and she'd just, oh, this is great. She's just jumping all over the place. And I thought, nobody taught her not to like winter, and she likes it. So therefore, it's mental. And I can learn to like winter too. So I changed, it was just a philosophy change or a mentality thing. And I decided I'm gonna like winter and learn that all you gotta do is accommodate to it. If it's cold, you bundle it and you, you and it works. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, I love that it's uh, because of your daughter when you know, she didn't even know any better that, uh, that that's what's changed your perspective on the landscape and, and, and your appreciation for it. Um, it speaks to um, how being amongst family members in landscapes can, can really shape your perspective. And mm -hmm. I think that when we look at a place like World's End today, um, one of the most special things about it, well, two things really. One, it's that it is a place for families. You know. Um, uh, it's always, you know, I, I actually saw a, a gentleman there just today. I was, I was driving out. He was, he was about to get lost. He, he stopped and asked me, you know, well, if I keep going this way, will it, will it get me uh, uh, down to Planters Hill? I said, you're, you're already on Planters Hill. Uh, we'll, we'll help you out. We'll get you there. But he's just, he was taking his son out there in a stroller. Uh, so, you know, so father and son. You see um, yeah. uh, on, on the weekends, whole family show up. Um, uh, or maybe it's a mother and a daughter or... Uh, 
it's special in that way, and it's also special in a way that it's still a place where uh, you'll walk the path, and you'll walk past uh, perhaps another family, or th there's a mother and a daughter, and they walk past uh, another, another set, another mother and a daughter, and, and there's a friendliness to it. You walk past, and you, you say hello to a stranger, um, and that's something that's preserved at World's End. And, and that's something I wanted to, to touch on with you. Uh, you've brought it up to me multiple times yes. in the conversations we've had. This idea of the importance of, of the family unit and how uh, World's End can, can be a place for that. Yeah, I, 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 I've always been sensitive to that. And when, mainly on weekends, a, a group comes along and it's obviously a family unit, I, I always encourage that because I think in this day and age when things are going so fast, if a family can get together, be a unit, and enjoy it together, those are the memories that those children are going to have being in a place like this and being out enjoying it with their parents mm. and it, it, it rubs off. The same memories perhaps that uh, that you would have had coming back to the property oh, yeah. uh, when when you were just visiting it still living in Rochester and the memories that are still being formed now with, exactly. uh, uh, with your grandchildren. With my grandchildren, yes. And, uh, and that's something that we still like to see today. So with that, um, that, that wraps up our, our conversation for today. Um, I'm really glad that you folks took the time to join us. Um, a couple of things before we're all said and done. Ryland and I will be up here um, if you have any questions um, uh, afterwards. Uh, Paul will also join us. If you have questions about the project that Paul and, uh, and Ryland worked on, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you uh, kind of afterwards in a, in, a, in a conversation setting. But before we get to that, if, uh, if there's any uh, questions from the audience that, that you'd like us to address while the room's still quiet, uh, we'd be happy to, to answer any. If you have a question, uh, yeah, sure. I was wondering, do you do any group walks like for people that, that get lost easily? Do you do, you do any group walks? Yeah, I think um, guided walks at World's End has been a part of that property uh, for a long time. You know, it, it's a property that people come to uh, uh, a lot of times for their own, you know, personal reasons, right? It, they they want to kind of get away from everything. But there's a smaller group of people who, who enjoy taking uh, a, a guided walk and, and learning a little bit about the property. Um, uh, we've done a couple of them this past year about the, the history of the property, looking at uh, the design history of the place. Uh, we've done another walk, and, and I actually picked this up from Ryland, but we just call it the, the World's and trees walk. We get right to the point. Uh, Ryland used to do it himself, and, and I try to do it when I can now. Um, there's, a, there's another walk that we do that we call World's End Curiosities, where um, we'll actually take a walk through the property and look at some of the things that Paul and Ryland found during their project, like, like the Cal Stone, uh, the old millstone, uh, potential sites where steamboats may have, may have uh, uh, landed, uh, all kinds of things that you might not actually know about the place, uh, structures that, that were, you were told were never built there that, oh, maybe they were. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a handful of opportunities. And there, yeah. there, there's a geology walk yes. every yep. year. Yep. Yep. By, a, by Les Toyola, yep. a very good geologist. And he, he has a really interesting walk. He goes out to Rocky Neck and explains the geology. Of there, there have been butterfly walks. Um, <coughs> several years ago, it was discovered that we have um, juniper hair streak butterflies, a rare butterfly. They only appear with cedar trees while we have cedar trees. Sure. And so there are a couple of, what's the word for butterfly people? Anyway. <laughs> I think that's actually good enough. I just call the bird people bird people. <laughs> a couple of uh, experts who come out and uh, lead a walk to show the hair streaks. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Speaking of bird people. Has anyone <laughs> since Shelby Birch done any bird walks and also talked about the bird path? You know, Clark, that, that, that's interesting. Birding at World's End has always been a big thing. Hmm. And we've had over the years, people who led bird walks. We had a very good fortunate uh, fortune. Um, when, we, when I first came back to Hingham in 1990, we had a, a woman by the name of Shelby Birch, who was an expert birder 
and loved to take people out. And she would have a walk every Saturday morning. Mm. Out of that, she, she then um, professionally had to leave. Um, out of that came a Saturday morning bird walk, which I participated in for many years. And uh, it diminished and got smaller and finally fell apart. Um, there are bird clubs that come out. Mm -hmm. for, the, for instance, the South Shore Bird Club, Audubon, um, for specific uh, bird walks. But we haven't done a bird walk, to my knowledge, in 15 years. I think it'd be a, a quality thing to add. Um, I'm more of a tree guy myself, um, and so, and, and I, I like the natural history of New England. So when I got brought on board to start planning some programs, I gravitated towards the things I was interested in. And, and if no one joined me, that didn't matter. I'd walk around and tell myself about it. But uh, um, there's such a, a large constituency of visitors who go there specifically to see the migrating birds that I think if we could uh, find a new expert, someone who certainly knows more about uh, the passing birds than I do, uh, to lead a walk, that'd be an excellent option. So, uh, any other now questions? The, other, the, oh, other, yeah, yeah, the yeah. other half of your question, bird boxes. Bird boxes, that's right, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've maintained a bird, well, Shelby started the bird boxes, putting up bluebird boxes, and it, we had a lot of bluebirds, and it, it worked very well. Evolutionarily, it was discovered in this part of the country, we have tree swallows. And they like the bluebird boxes too. And they are higher on the pecking order than bluebirds are. So if they get to a box and the bluebird is trying to set up house, they'll kick them out. <laughs> Not good for the bluebird. So I believe it was Cornell um, Ornithology who came up with the idea of putting two boxes up, 20, 30 feet apart. Well, the tree swallow will dominate and go to one box, and he won't let another tree swallow in the other box because he'd be in competition. But he will let the bluebirds in because the bluebird has a different eating habit. Tree swallows eat flying insects. They catch them on the wing. The bluebirds eat ground terrestrial bugs. So they go down to the ground to get their food. So there's no competition on food. So they coexist very nicely. Hmm. So we have this bird trail, bluebird trail, and I've tried to maintain it. Pete, I think, is taking it over. I started last uh, February, which, as a matter Which of fact, is yeah. wonderful. And First, he um, called me to say he wasn't going to be a ranger anymore. And then he said, would you mind taking care of the bluebird boxes, too? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's the story with the bluebird boxes. We try to maintain the trail. Now, bluebirds are in trouble in this part of the country. They're, they're not nearly as many as there should be. Uh, for, and it's not only World's End, it's general northeast. Mm. So... Hopefully, they'll recover and come back. I, I've gone through the period when we didn't think we'd ever see a bluebird, and that was in after DDT and mm -hmm. Rachel Carson's alarm. Bluebirds did come back, and uh, it, it, I certainly hope they're not in trouble for some other reason than we think. Uh, one more question, if, if anyone has one, and then, uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm intrigued. I've, I've heard that uh, World's End, especially the, the top hill, is very fertile. And mm. usually when you think of uh, glacial drumlins, yeah, well, they're kind of barren. They are, they are glacial drumlins, and of course what a glacial drumlin is, is the residual of the glacier as it receded. And it is gravel, yes. Yeah. But for many, many thousands of years that land started hosting flora yeah. and the flora makes soil and so the settlers 
their favorite place to do their farming was World's End because the land was more fertile out there than it was on the mainland. Yeah, I think I, I described it in some way at the last lecture where, you know, when World's End first got formed, it would have felt like if you were up on top of Mount Lafayette or uh, anywhere in the Whites where, uh, you know, these big rocky uh, uh, landscapes. And as you start coming out of there and you're into the Alpine uh, zone, lichens, um, very small uh, 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 rocky-based plants start to crop up. And then you get in subalpine and you start entering, you know, ferns and different mosses, uh, uh, shrub, shrub life that can consist. And that's very similar. If, if you think about your travel from the top of a, a peak in the White Mountains down to uh, one of the valleys, and then think about it as a time scale. So maybe at the top you're at uh, directly post-glaciation. Um, and as you're coming down from the mountain, you're going through uh, hundreds of years at a time. And by the time you get into the valley, it'd be almost like the landscape that, you know, we'd see today. Um, so all of that happened at World's End. Um, it was forested, and that forest created a fertile base. And then by the time settlers got here, it, it pretty quickly became deforested um, in a much shorter period of time than it took for it all to get there and right. create that beautiful soil. But, uh, but yes, yeah, that, I'd say that that's about as close as we could describe it. Yeah. Thank you so much, folks. We're doing one more lecture um, uh, next Thursday. Um, I'll be doing it with Michael Achille right here from the library. Um, and uh, it'll be all about the Brewer family. We're talking about a family, uh, a story of philanthropy, and not just their involvement at uh, World's End, but, but throughout the town of Hingham and, uh, and what they meant to, to this town and, and uh, uh, what that looks like. So we'd hope you join us for our last in, in the series. Um, we're really grateful to have uh, HCAM here, uh, Hingham Public Access TV. So if you missed the first lecture, they'll be posting it. Um, and you can catch it there, and, and they'll be having the whole lecture series up uh, before long. So um, that's a great place to watch it if you missed um, a couple of them. So we hope to see you next Thursday, uh, same time and place. Thanks again.